Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. I want you to write this down in your notes. Please take notes quickly. I want to therefore address the subject, the principle and the process of generational transfer. The principle and the process of generational transfer. It's amazing that sometimes we don't understand the, the times we are living in. There was a nation that God was impressed with, or should I say a tribe that impressed God. Israel had tri 12 tribes, and one of them, God specifically said, was the most important one, and it was not Judah. He said that tribe's name was Issachar. And God specifically told us why Issachar was so important among all the 12 tribes. He said they had two things that the other tribes didn't have. They were the smallest tribe, matter of fact, and they didn't have an army. And yet they were the most important tribe. He said they were important because, number one, they understood the times. And number two, therefore they knew what to do. He said that's why they are the most important tribe in Israel. They understood the times, and then because of that, they knew what they should be doing. One time, Jesus told the people in the community that he was living among, especially the religious leaders, he said, you do not know the times of your visitation. In other words, it's possible for you to be living in a moment and don't understand the moment. Therefore, you don't know what you should be doing at that moment. We have entered a moment in history as a country. This moment has to do with our nation. And God always thinks about nations. The principle of nation was created by God. God established nations, and he establishes nations for a reason. Therefore, the Bahamas was not established by a group of men who sat around a table. They were being used by a greater divine power to accomplish a goal that was divine. Therefore, the Bahamas was established by God in heaven before it entered earth. And there was a timing for that. As a matter of fact, I think it's important to understand that the nations created by God began when God first created Adam. God intended for earth to have one nation and that nation was to be headed by the Adamic race. And all nations therefore are products of God. In Malachi chapter 12 verse 21 it says in the name in his name the nations will put their hope. We put our hope in so many other things, but God says, I want the nations to trust me. How do we know that God created nations? Let's read a verse that you heard earlier in this celebration. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. Can we read it together out loud? Please read. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by man's hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. Next verse. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. Next verse. And he says, God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, 
though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our economy. As some of your own poets have said, we are his. I want you to write down what that verse just told us specifically. I pulled them out for you. Number one, why did God create nations? Well, first of all, write it down. God says he created nations. Number two, he creates the nations for a time. It says he sets the time for them. That means every nation has a time. And there's something it has to do within that time. There are nations that have died. And some nations are dying. Their time is up. Next he says, nations are composed of God's choice. You just read, the Bible says, he chooses who will live in them. Very few of us originate from the Caribbean. Probably none of us. We were moved by something. Either by a boat, or an aircraft brought us here somewhere in history. So he chose to create a country called the Bahamas out of people from different places. And he's still adding to this nation from different places. Next, he says nations are located by God's choice. It says he chooses who would be in them and where they should be. The Bahamas was located by God. We are in a strategic location by divine order. And I don't think even our government understands the importance of our proximity to the nations around us. We're not using our location. But God also says something else. He says that he creates a nation, write it down, so that men may what? Seek him. The purpose for a country is for people to find God. That is clear in the Bible. So when people come to your country, do they see God? Do they feel the presence of God? Are your policies and your legislation reflecting God? Is your culture reflecting God? Nations like the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites no longer exist. Do you know why? They began to worship idols. They began to sacrifice their babies dipped in goat's milk. They burned their children on the altar. They killed young women who were 12 years old as sacrifices to, 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 to Mullah. In other words, God says, look, if you have a culture that doesn't represent me, I will wipe you from the earth. We cannot find these nations anymore. So when your country begins to sacrifice babies, we call it abortion, you are tampering with the very life of your country. Don't think that you are immune to dissolution by God. God can dissolve a country. We cannot find the Moabites. Do you know that the land of Canaan, Canaan, should I say this? Canaan was the black son of Noah. That means the African heritage ruled the land of Canaan. Guess who took it over? God told Moses, I will take you to the land of Canaan. For the people there have defiled the land. <laughs> they began to worship demons. They began to offer up sacrifices to gods. They burned their children in Canaan. The Canaanites became evil and God gave their land to somebody else. If you don't introduce God in your land, other people will take over your country. Next he says, so that men may reach out to him. That's why God made a country. And that men might find him, he says. That's why God makes a nation. That men might depend on God, not their geniuses. It is me, he says, who give you life and breath. It's not the investor. It's not the, the business banker that moves in to hire a couple of people. He said, it is me who give you life. Never tie your life up to a barrel that can go dry. 
connect to an eternal God who never runs out. In other words, he says, create a culture that introduces, introduces men to God. I want you, he says, as a nation, to make sure everything you do will establish moral standards that expose God's nature. Any country with a moral code that doesn't represent God will be dissolved. And we don't learn from history. We still don't get the message. And some of the things we're doing right now is so important that we need to be checking what we are making as far as decisions and law. Look at Revelation 9, 5 verse 9. Let's read together, please. And with your blood, you purchase men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be what? A kingdom of priests and to serve the Lord and they will reign on where? The earth. In other words, God says, I created nations that they may be a kingdom of priests for me. Look at the book of Psalm 2, verse 1. Read it, please. Go. Why do the nations conspire and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth take their stand. Read it out loud. And the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. In other words, let's get rid of God. We don't want no one to tell us what to do. We don't want God in our politics. We don't want God in our legislation. Let's break off this so-called spiritual bondage. We need to be free. And God says they conspire against him. That means they make laws right in the face of God that are diametrically opposed to what God wants. Very dangerous. Look at the next verse. Read out loud, please. Psalm 2, 4. Read. And one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill, because I'm going to ignore your laws and still bring Jesus. You're going to come to the point where you realize he's still the way for national development. Can I hear an amen? amen. Go ahead and give God a hand. A nation, therefore, is a component created by God. And every nation must have these things. Write them down. A common language, common values, common covenant, common culture, common moral standards, and common respect. They must have these things in common. And that means that a nation must have a commitment to unity. And the key to nation building is it must have a national purpose, a national vision, a national divine reference. That's important. In other words, they must refer all of their legal decisions to a higher power. Number four, they must have a national moral code. They must have a national value system. They must have a national social consciousness. And they must have a national spirit of love and respect for one another. This is what nations are made out of. Look at Psalm, I mean Genesis rather, 12, verse 12. Read, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Abraham, come on, read it loud. Then the Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will what? Show you as the land of Canaan. Next verse, I will make you into a great nation. There was a nation already in the land. In other words, God could cancel your country. You don't even know it's canceled. And foreigners start coming in. You don't know your time is over. And sooner or later, they are more than you. God sent Abraham not to empty land. He sent him to a land that had Canaanites, Moabites, Jebusites, Hittites. In other words, God could fire you and you're still on the job. When you start doing evil, God will slowly take over your country and you'll find foreigners in the house of assembly. Abraham, I'm giving you a nation, a land that other people live in, he says. Look at the next verse, read. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you, and all the people of the earth through you will be blessed. I'll bless the nation through your nation. In other words, God created the nation of Israel to be a blessing to the nations, to be a standard to the nations. Look at Deuteronomy 4, verse 6, read. Observe then carefully, for this will show you your wisdom, he says, and understanding the nations who will hear about your laws and decrees, and they will say what? 
Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. What other nation is so great to, as to have their gods near to them the way the Lord our God is near to us whenever we pray to him? Look at verse 8, read out loud. And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous laws and decrees as this body of law I am setting before you today? God says what makes you different is the laws you create. Nations are making laws that are very dangerous right now. Look at the next verse, read. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. In other words, I want a nation, not a church, not a religion. I want to build a nation, he says. Look at Psalm 33 verse 12, read. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people who chose by him to be his, his inheritance. Look at Psalm 33, 16, read. No king is saved by the size of his military army. And no warrior is saved by his strength. So law enforcement ain't going to save our criminal problems. You can build a defense force all you want. God's that, that ain't going to save your country. You can put bars on your window and put electrical cameras everywhere. God says, that's the thing going to save your country. Your strength will not save you, he says. And we spend billions of dollars in the world and countries trying to build armies and build security. God says, that won't keep your city. I'm the only one that will protect your country. Look at Psalm 33, read. But the eyes of the Lord <laughs> are on those who fear him. God says, you don't need more war weapons. You need the fear of God to come back to your country. People ain't afraid of God no more. And God said, therefore, that's why you need a lot of police dogs, a lot more police cars. You need a lot of army weapons because you don't fear God. Watch this. Read it again. The eyes of the Lord will be upon a country who fears him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in the middle of economic crisis. Clap, clap, clap. According to God, I know this sounds very stupid sometimes, but according to God, if you fear him, he'll turn your economy around. Among all the nations, something will happen in your country. You may discover oil in your backyard if you fear God. If you fear me, he says, I will keep you from famine. That means other nations will fall into wreck economically, but you will be preserved because of what? Fear of God. I wish and hope that our prime minister would declare one day this week a day of fasting and prayer and give us a holiday just to pray, not to dance and wind our hips up, but to pray. Why? If we fear God again, he says, I'll turn the economy around. You all act like you're a believer, just God you just read in the Bible. The fear of God will protect you from what? Farming, he says. That's economic crisis. Look at Proverbs 11, 14, read. For the lack of guidance, a nation falls. That means they lack good counsel. They keep making bad decisions because they get wrong counsel from wrong people. They hire more wrong consultants. The nation will fall. But in the presence of many good advisors, he says what? Victory is sure. In other words, you need to check the kind of people you're getting counsel from. You know, all nations want to be successful, don't they? That's why we sing, you know, march on Bahama land. We want to march on to greatness. Every country wants to be successful. And what is the key or the keys to national success? I want to show you where we're at right now. I want to read very quickly from our constitution, our preamble. It says, whereas 481 years ago, the rediscovery of the family of the islands, rocks and keys heralded the rebirth of the new world. I want to focus on one word in this now. And whereas the people of this family of islands recognizing that the preservation of their freedom, everybody say freedom, freedom. will be guaranteed by national commitment to self-discipline, industry, loyalty, unity, and an, 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 an abiding respect for Christian values and the rule of law. Now, I want you to focus on the word freedom. The goal here is freedom. Let me prove that. Look at the next statement in the Constitution. It says what? Now know ye therefore, we the inheritors and the successors of this family of islands, recognizing the supremacy of God and believing in the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual, we thereby proclaim in solemn praise the establishment of a free, there's that word free again, every page is free. Free, 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 everybody say freedom. Free 
democratic sovereign nation founded on spiritual values and in which no man, woman, or child shall ever be what? Slave and bondsman to anyone or their labor exploited for their lives or their lives frustrated by deprivation. Now, I want you to notice that this whole thing is about freedom. You know why? The Bahamas used to be a slave colony. I tasted it just a little bit. My father's here this morning. He's 89 years old. He knew what it was to really be oppressed. I remember when we couldn't drive out west. Right by the hotel that's being built, there was a bar across there like Life at Key. We couldn't drive beyond that. Some of you young people don't know that. That was a, that's where Life at Key started. It started right there where the, the hotel is. And we would go driving on Sunday mornings, I mean Sunday evenings after church. My father would take us in that big car and when we reached there, we had to stop. The police says, turn around. You, could, you couldn't go along Bay Street. Why? Only white folks can live there, they say. Apartheid. I remember when no one could go to Queen's College except they were white. When I went to Queen's College, we were, we were just a few of us. And we got in because of our grades being exceptional, not because they liked us. And the government had to make them take us in. I tasted that. I remember when we were going, walking down the Bay Street. We had to walk past some places quickly because they would say, what are you doing around here? Restaurants, we couldn't go in. They had a, a sign in the back say, blacks only. That was in the Bahamas. So you could go in the back and get served. You couldn't go through the front. You couldn't sit in the restaurant. Only white folks could sit there. You folks don't know that. I went through that. There were movies placed in the city where you couldn't go to the movies. Only whites, they said whites only to the movies. So when movies came here, we couldn't go see them. It was only for white people. I'm not prejudiced. I'm just telling you the facts. So when they say freedom in this constitution, they, they remember, they're saying, look, this will never happen again. And some of y'all, when it was supposed to be dancing this morning, you was cute, man. I was dancing because I remember them things, man. Forty years later is a generation. I will have my last dance because I made it to a generation where we were free from that. Now, I want to tell you something very important here. God always promises freedom while you're in the land of slavery. God told the children of Israel, there's a land with milk and honey. He told them that when they were in bondage. God always gives you promise about light when you are in darkness. Secondly, God always raises up a deliverer to bring you out of physical oppression physical oppression but here's the problem God never takes oppressed people directly to freedom write that down God will never take oppressed people directly to freedom never if you study history he never took them direct to freedom because their mind is a problem and I want to say this right now the Bahamas is not free yet we are delivered don't confuse the two. In other words, God will always lead people into a stage of deliverance. A period where he gives them an opportunity to learn how to live in freedom. Because freedom is a difficult place to live. And it took them 40 years to make it to that point. Do you understand the times? And when they reach 40 years... God says, if you didn't change your mind, I'm going to kill you. This is found in the Bible. He gives you 40 years to change your thinking from black crab to no crab. He gives you 40 years to transform your thinking from killing your own brothers and sisters, from stopping their progress, from hindering their advancement. He gives you 40 years to change your mind. I know exactly where we are. As a matter of fact, here's what I believe may be helpful. Exodus 13 verse 17. Let's read it loud. Go. When Pharaoh, come on, read it loud. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, even though that was shorter. Stop reading. My wife and I went to Egypt some years ago, and we went from Egypt to Israel. We flew from Tel Aviv to Cairo. It took 20 minutes. 
When I landed, I was confused. I said to my guide, uh, why are we here so quickly? He says, well, it takes 40 days to walk from Cairo to Tel Aviv. No, let me say it slowly. It takes 40 days to walk from Egypt to Canaan. 40 days. God says, I ain't going to take them the short way. Read the next statement. He says, for if they face war, that means responsibility, pressure, struggles, they might change their minds and return to slavery. Oh boy. There are some people today who still want to go back. God says, I can take you there in 40 days. But it's not your location I'm concerned about. It's your mentality. Read the next words, verse 18. So God led them around the desert. Who led them? God. He, <laughs> he led them around the desert road toward the Red Sea. He led them into a test to check their minds. It says, the Israelites went up out of Egypt armed for battle. They didn't know how to fight. They never had an army. In other words, you got on suit and can't calculate. You put on a fine dress, but you still can't run a bank. Armed, but they know where to fight. Can't fight. We look good, but we ain't able to handle it. And they still believe you can't own a hotel. They still believe you can't own a bank. They still believe you can't own an organization that's global. They say, just get a job and make beds and weed the yard, they say. That's all. In your suit, weed the yard. Dress, but can't fight. Are you listening to me? God says, I'll leave them the long way. Listen, God is more concerned about your transformation than he is about your relocation. God says, I don't want you to go to Canaan yet because you ain't got the Canaan mentality. So I'm going to keep you in this desert for 40 years. God, the promises always demand preparation. God will never give you what you don't qualify to manage. They couldn't manage freedom. So he put them in a classroom called Sinai for 40 years to see if he can get them to be trained mentally to handle responsibility. And they failed the test. They actually failed the test. As a matter of fact, true freedom imposes more law and demands more work and requires more responsibility than slavery. Freedom is taking responsibility for your own life. And we don't want to do that. We still believe that the foreigner is smarter. The investor is more intelligent. And so we give them all kinds of perks, all kinds of, of opportunities. And we still don't trust our own people because we are fighting with this spirit of you ain't responsible yet. We got behaviors with PhDs who cannot be permitted to run a bank. And we got folks who come to high school in charge of them. Forty years. Stay with me, please. You can't sleep on this today. I'm telling you now, this is heavy stuff. Transformation is more important than relocation. Write it down. In other words, mental freedom is more important than physical deliverance. Nothing can, cor can corrupt Canaan more than Egyptian slavery thinking. That's why Canaan demands conversion. The enemy of freedom is a slave mentality. And freedom is so special, God will keep you out of it until you get the freedom mentality. In other words, you need to change the mentality in order to enjoy the relocation. God always provides miraculously when you are in deliverance. That's why we survived 40 years. We still can't believe how we made it. Our tourism industry boomed in the last 40 years. And we can't take credit for that. It's a miracle that a country with just rock and sand has 6 million tourists. That could be wiped out in one day. So we got to be careful. It's a miracle. God provides miracles and deliverance. He gave them free food, free clothing, free water from a rock, gave them free healing from a snake on a pole. Everything was free. Why? Miracles and deliverance. But when the 40 years is up, 
the manna stops, the water doesn't come from the rock anymore, and the snake dies. That means you got to go dig your own wells, plant your own farms, and you better eat properly to take care of your own body. 40 years. God will never take a people to the land of freedom until he has taken the land of oppression out of their minds. In other words, God is willing to wait for the right generation to go into the land of freedom. And he will wait if he has to wait 40 years. Can I put it to you this way? God always raises up a new leader to take the people into freedom. When the people arrive in the land of freedom, the miraculous stops and the work begins. In the land of freedom, you must grow your own food. You must sew your own clothing and build your own homes. In freedom, you must fight your own battles. Oh boy. We still calling for foreign help. Hmm. You know, when they came out of Egypt, they didn't fight a single person. God killed a whole army of Pharaoh by himself. They never fought. But when they went into the land of Canaan, the first day, the first thing Joshua saw was Jericho. And the first thing he saw was a man dressed in an armor. The first thing Moses saw was a burning bush, a miracle. The first thing Joshua saw was a man in armor, a fighter. God was saying, okay, in, Joseph time, in Moses' time, everything is, everything is a miracle. In Joshua time, you better fight your way to get what you, what you need. And Joshua had to fight to possess the land. In other words, there must be the breaking of the chain mentally. Write this down, please, out loud. I want you to write this down. What is the responsibility of freedom? Freedom is a tough place. We're about to enter it. 40 years means that we are about to leave the wilderness and cross over. 40 years always is the mark God gives in, in Scripture for a generational cross. Let me prove that for you. Here's a verse you probably never saw before. And write this down, please. I'm going to talk about 40 for a minute and I'll show you a verse. 40 is the number in the Bible for generation. As a matter of fact, generation is the fullness of national service. God gives you 40 years for national service. That means to serve your country. After that, you better have done your job. I'll prove that in a minute. Number three, generation is the completion of one phase and the transfer to another. That's what 40 means. 40 also means the number of succession. 40 also means the number of transfer. 40 also means the number of transformation. That means if you don't change at 40, God gets rid of you. Let's see if this is true. Read 2 Samuel 5 verse 4. Read. David was... 30 years old when he became king. And he reigned how long? 40 years in Hebron. He reigned Judah for seven years, six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned all over Israel for 33, which makes 40. And then David died. Look at the next verse. 1 Kings 11, 42. Read. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem how long? 40 years. Then he rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, his father. And Rehoboam, his son, what? Succeeded him. All of them at 40. Still not convinced. Let's try one more. Psalm 95 verse 10. Read. For 40 years, God says, I was angry with this generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray. They have not known my ways, so I declared by an oath. God is swearing. Now watch this. They shall never enter that land. God swore, I'm going to kill all of them. Because they would not change their mentality. The people who have been in leadership in our country were all over 70 now. If you calculate, they came out of Egypt. So the scent of the slave ship is still in their nostrils. So mentally, they can't make the crossover. They are good people. Be nice now, brother. They are good people. They have a tremendous desire to cross over, but they just can't mentally make it. Sometimes we call them uh, uh, bankrupt of ideas. Look at it. I just read it to you. God says, when you reach 40, you're supposed to back on the side and let somebody else take it. 40 years, back on the side. Now, in other words, God says at 40, you are beyond thinking creatively now. 
So you keep bringing up the old system, the old methods, the old style, same old rehash. Why? Because you are stuck in the old generation. Give God a hand for a new revelation coming. We have to get this right. I prophesy now that the next general election cannot reappoint the same leaders. Impossible. I'm telling you, by divine design, that's impossible. Every leader in the Bible finished at 40. And they succeeded. And by the way, David didn't wait till he died to give it to Solomon. Solomon didn't wait till he died to give it to Rehoboam. In other words, you don't wait till you die. You give it to them while you're living. Here, son, take it to the next level. I'm stuck. Is there anybody here, young people? Come on, say amen. We need some of these folks to get a revelation. 40 years means time up. Either you change or die. Oh boy, y'all gotta pray for me. <laughs> Look at this. There's no greater burden than freedom. That's why God says you gotta be free to get into freedom. In other words, everyone cries for freedom, but few of them understand it. That's why we can't get there. Freedom is like love and beauty. It's, it, you can't understand it, but you know it when you feel it. It's strange. The human spirit wants to be free. We have a desire to be free. But here's what I wanna close on today. There's a picture of a dog tied to a post. This dog is a real dog. This is a picture of a dog that had an experiment by a psychologist. They tied the dog to a stake with a chain. Then they placed food in front of the dog. But they placed it just far away that he couldn't reach it. And the dog was so hungry, he dashed toward the food with all of his strength. And when he jabbed, he leaped, the chain yanked his neck back and he choked. But he looked at the food, he was so hungry. He jumped at it again and he choked. And he jumped at it again and he choked. And he kept jumping at the food, but it was too far away. And his neck began to wear against the chain and then blood began to show up on his neck and he felt the pain and the dog decided the pain is too great it's greater than the food so the dog refused to move that dog <laughs> looked at the food after they loosed the chain He was free, but he was afraid to go to the food because he remembered the pain. He was free, but he refused to go to the food because he remembered the pain. See, the problem is the memory of the pain. Are we afraid to believe we can do great things at 40? Yes, we are. You go to apply for a certain type of business to your own government, and they will say to you, you can't do that. They will tell you you can't do it. How do they know that? They don't know that. But they've been tied to the stake so long. And they were told no for so long. They believed that, that, that they can't reach the food. Write this down, please. This is very important. We can die in the presence of resources. Africa is suffering from this right now. The wealthiest continent on earth is Africa and yet it's the poorest you can die in the presence of plenty even though you call yourself free 
The memory is more powerful than the chain. In other words, the chain is still in your mind. <laughs> in other words, we are tied to a stake. Our social and economic and religious conditioning ties us to an invisible stake and positions does not guarantee disposition. You change your position, but your disposition is still the same. In other words, new does not guarantee change. Without mental transformation, you can go to a new place, but continue to do the old things. What you feed your soul determines your quality of life, and, de and, it, it, and de it, de it decrees your freedom. In essence, freedom is a result of mental adjustment, not relocation. The children of Israel never made it to Canaan. Their location was changed, but their mentality never did. Forty years, they were still thinking the same way. I want to show you something about these people. You know, it is, a, it is possible to be delivered and not free. Deliverance is the physical relocation and liberation of a person. It removes your, your environment of oppression. Deliverance is separation of the slave from the physical condition of slavery. Deliverance is, is just physical relocation or the breaking of something physical. We must never confuse deliverance with, with, with slavery or freedom. As a matter of fact, oppression is the cancellation of self-determination. I can't make my life anymore. This is called breaking the spirit. Oppression produces a deep spirit of dependency and lack of self-determination. When you are in slavery, you become dependent on the master and you're afraid to think for yourself. That's why creativity is never among slaves. Because the master thinks for them. They were not trained to think about solving their own problems with new ideas. A slave mentality is never creative. Write that down. A slave mentality thinks about pain, not about planning. A slave mentality always thinks of what cannot be done, why it can't be done, the pain. Your mental state is more important than your physical state. You are truly not free until your mind is liberated. This is why at 40, as a country, we must deal with our question. What are we mentally? Freedom is first a mental condition before it is a physical statement. This was the foundation of the freedom statement of Jesus Christ. He never says that someone will set you free. He said, you shall know. The truth. Truth is what? Knowing the truth is a mental experience. You will know the truth about yourself. Something's supposed to happen in your mind and then you are free. I became free when my mind discovered who I was in Christ. My whole life changed. So my books are now in 122 countries now in 67 languages and they are reading me all over the world and they're quoting me on TV now and I still live on the island here. Why? Because I had to stop being a Bahamian. You got to become a global citizen thinker if you're going to be free from this small mental mentality in the Bahamas. You could own a bank. You could own your own fishing company with big boats, 10 of them. You could run a hotel and own it. But they say you can't. Why? They're stuck to the chain. 40 years later. Is it possible to do it 40 years later? You know... Your mental state is more important than your physical state. I want to show you a scripture and then a statement I want you to write. Write this down. No one is more dangerous than a mountain man with a valley mentality. Can I quote it again? No one is more dangerous than a mountain man with a valley mentality. We're on the mountain now, you know. But our mind didn't make it. It's still in the valley. Change gone, mind still set. <laughs> One of the things that I learned is that deliverance is not freedom. It prepares you for freedom. You are not free until your mind is free. Your mind can only be freed by the discovery of the truth about yourself. Freedom is not the absence of law. Freedom is actually a requirement of more law, of discipline and responsibility. Deliverance provides you the opportunity to be free. When God delivered those people out of Egypt, they weren't free. He took 40 years and gave them a chance to see if they are ready for freedom. And they didn't make it. Write this down, please, the 
and Sir Winston Churchill said it so well. He said, the price of greatness is responsibility. You want to be great? You got to become responsible for your own future. Design and believe that you can actually design your own future. This is why I believe that the, the greatest prototype we have about slavery is the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. This photograph I got from the internet is supposed to be depicting the Israelites in slavery. And I thought about this. It is easier to exist in slavery than to live in freedom. Some people are so busy trying to get over their past, they don't have time to live their future. There is no freedom without responsibility. And I like what Philippians 3 says, verse 13, this one thing I do, I what? Forget the things behind me. We are still dragging the weight mentally of our past. Now, I want to warn you, you should never forget your past, but don't carry it with you. Because the children need the past to appreciate the future. Tell them the story. It's important. Can I put it this way? When your spirit is broken, you have no more desire to go to the future. And what slaves dread the most is a broken spirit. You stop trying. You stop wanting to achieve greatness. Look at this picture. That's us at 40. Imprisoned in the mind. Mental slavery can last for 40 years, a generation. 40 days and 40 years from freedom. The Israelites took 40 years to walk 40 days. Ladies and gentlemen, the shortest distance between two points is what? Straight line. So the short way was 40 days. They got to go straight to freedom, Canaan. God says, you know something? Uh, I need to fix their heads. So what God did was this. God took them, and in this little area here called Sinai, he just took them in circles. For 40 years, they went in circles. 40 years... And God, why God got these people walking for 40 years? It's like, I mean, the line right there. God said, no, you ain't ready for that yet? Mm -mm. A new Bahamas right there, but no, uh, mm -mm -mm. not this old thinking going in there. I'm going to kill all of y'all right here in the desert. And if you read the Bible, the Bible says God led them around for 40 years in the wilderness. And he even fed them, healed them, protected them, but didn't take them in. Because God feeding you doesn't mean you're going in. Y'all should clap right there. That's a serious place to clap. Okay, some of y'all saying, Pastor Miles, is this in the Bible? Exodus chapter 13, 17. Read, go. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. Again, if they face war, he said, they might change their mind. Look at verse 18. So God led them around the desert toward the Red Sea. God set them up. In other words... God wanted to take them away from oppression, mentally. Now let's read what I call the six benefits of oppression. I did say it. The benefits of oppression, number one, read it. The oppressor protects you. Number two, the oppressor fights for you. Number three, the oppressor thinks for you. Number four, the oppressor provides for you. <laughs> number five, the oppressor plans for you. Number six, the oppressor makes the oppressed depend on him. There you go. That's the benefits. That's the Bahamas 60 years ago. The oppressor makes you useless. He destroys thinking. They used to fly peanut butter and cheese to us. Some of you all don't remember this. And they used to come and bring it out in the neighborhood in Bain Town from the British. They used to give us cheese and, and plenty of peanut butter, free. They used to pave the roads. They had their, their ship out there taking care of us. We were just like children. Hmm. So they told us, you don't need education. 
So there was no schools for us. Why? You don't need education. You just need to learn how to, to plant cane. And in some islands, grow cotton. That's it. Why education? We're going to think for you. You don't need to think. That's why we love oppression. Oppression is so attractive. Because it makes you lazy. We sang that night when the fly came down and the new flag went up, everybody was shouting. All of a sudden we realized, uh oh, we have to run our own country now. Hmm? We gotta build our own economy now. Oops, we gotta build our own education system now. We gotta even have our own curriculum. Uh oh, we gotta believe that our people can do this. In other words, responsibility is the result of freedom. The oppressor makes you lazy. I want you to read a couple of verses before we pray. Numbers 11 verse 4, read. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic at no cost. But now we have lost our appetite. We need, we never see anything but manna, what God provides. Take a deep breath. That is in the Bible. Let's go back to the good old days. Free peanut butter, free cheese, free paving roads by the British money. Hmm. Free Sunday school quarterlies from Tennessee. Free Anglican worship books from England. How about your own book? In other words, we, we, we're so dependent. We can't even think of a new industry in the Bahamas. The last industry was given to us was given to us by Conky Joe. And we still got it. We, we ain't smart enough yet to develop another one. Please, uh, uh, listen, you don't understand my language, right? Please. He says, they said, we remember the fish that costs nothing why can't you get a boat and catch your own fish can your own fish export your own fish we got over six billion dollars worth of fish in our in our oceans right now we rather import because it costs too much to can to even think of a canning factory it's just too complicated because the Egyptian mentality is still in charge. I'm so glad you're here, young man. I hope that you can get into leadership of this country and believe that nothing is impossible. Amen. Write this down. It is not what you are that holds you back. It's what you think you are not. That holds you back. What you see and what you hear are small things compared to what you think. The mentality, 40 years, last chance we get. This is interesting. God can empower our minds, but you must empower your will. The human will is the most powerful force on earth. And God is able to deliver the people from the power of Pharaoh, but not from the power of their own minds. The most difficult thing in life I've learned is to try and change a human's mind. It's almost impossible. I want you to look at this picture for a minute. Here's a man holding down another man. <laughs> I want to demonstrate this. Can you come here, my son? I want to show you all the mentality. Can you uh, lay down on that stage for me, please? Can you come here, my son? Just lay down. 
I want you to see this visually. Can you hold him down? Go in the front. Go in the, go on the other side. Yeah, I want the camera to say, okay, hold him down. Just, you, you, you're going to hold him down now. Here's the problem. I'm going to let you see this on the board. You cannot hold a man down without staying down with him. That's the Bahamas in some cases right here, most cases. You go to a bank, the fellow who tells you no look like you. Come on, clap anyhow. You go to the insurance company, the fellow who don't want to pay you what you paid all them years look like you. You go to get a business license, the fellow who across the table asks you what you want license for this thing for. You can't do this. This is too big for you. And the guy holding you down, that's why he's still there. He can't get promoted because he's holding people back. I'm going to show you how this works now. Now, I'm go, he's, he is committed to holding him down, right? But I'm over here. I'm calling him. I want to promote you to CEO. Now, here's your position. Bigger pay, more money, car, perks, vacation. Woo! Now, he got to make a decision. That's why people can't get promoted in the Bahamas. 40 years, we still holding people down. In other words, in the past, we used to pull them down. It's worse now. We hold them down. Tell your neighbor, 40 days and 40 years, is up. that's enough. This is it. We got to change everything right now. You dance over this week? Yeah, dance. But on Thursday morning, God has a clock that goes off. The alarm rings. That's it. 40 is up. What you all going to do now? If you let him go, you can get ahead. Let him go. Look at him. Help him up. See that? Help him up. That's a Bahamian, a new Bahamian. Come on, give God a hand. You help your brother up, man. The power of the oppressor is what? Ignorance. If they can keep you ignorant of the truth about your ability, they can oppress you. It's my prayer for you today that you would remember that there is no freedom without responsibility. I'm going to give you a list very quick of the 10 effects of oppression. Number one, irresponsibility. Number two, the hatred for hard work. Number three, the spirit of laziness. Number four, the spirit of fear. Number five, the spirit of low self-esteem. Number six, the spirit of poor self-concept. Number seven, the spirit of selfishness. Number eight, the spirit of lack of creativity. Number nine, the spirit of distrust. You don't trust your own people. And number 10, a lack of initiative. You wait for people to tell you what to do. That's what oppression produces, that mentality. It's a dangerous one. And those are the things we're still battling with. We are struggling to get out of the desert. And at 40 years, we need to be remembered and we need to forget where we came from. I want to read a verse of scripture. Exodus 14 verse 21. Read. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. All that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on each side. Look at verse 2, read. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses, the same guy who just let him free. You know, when I hear people talk bad about Sir Linden, I get angry. And the folks who talking bad ain't done nothing. Y'all better clap, man, clap. All y'all Bahamians, he's our father. The Bible never says to honor your perfect father. It says honor your father. Once you identify who Moses is, you better be careful. You remember Miriam? 
You start talking bad about the person who delivered you, God will kill you. God says, hey, hey Miriam, I'm going to kill you, Miriam. Your brother ain't perfect, but he's the deliverer. The same guy that set him free, what are they doing? They're murmuring. Let's see what they said. They said what? If only we had died by the Lord's hands. And each, these people must be crazy. You see, when that pressure of freedom hits, they want to die. Could you imagine people crying for freedom for 430 years? They're finally free, and their first complaint is, we want to go back. Mental damage. Read the next statement. If only we had died by the Lord's hands in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out here in the free Bahamas to starve. This man set them, no, he delivered them from slavery. They said, you set us up to kill us. We want to go back to garlic and onions. At least it was free. Exodus 16, 4, read. And the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for these people. They have to go out each day and gather enough for themselves. In other words, I'll take care of them in deliverance. I'll, del I'll take care of them. Look at verse 4, Deuteronomy 8, read. Your clothes did not wear out. Your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord... God will discipline you. Because I, I took care of you. Why are you murmuring so much? The most ungrateful people. I listened to the radio stations this week. I had to turn it off. Everybody come. Well, they didn't do this. And they didn't do that. 40 years, man. Everything negative. God says, you're not going to make it. You didn't even appreciate the free food. I kept your shoes for 40 years, didn't wear out. That's a miracle, eh? Yep. Your clothes, he said, didn't wear out for 40 years. Same clothes for 40 years. God, please give us that material again. A miracle. They're complaining. They want to go back to slavery. Hmm? Let me just show you one more verse. Numbers 14, read. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me? With contempt. How long will they refuse to believe me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed for them? Here's my conclusion. The wilderness is the institute of discipline. The last 40 years, God was trying to get us to discipline ourselves, to change our thinking about ourselves and about him. They wouldn't get the lesson. They never got the lesson. The wilderness is the university of work. It trains you to work for yourself now. You worked for the master for 40 years, now you're going to work for yourself, he says. Learn how to be responsible. 40 years means that you are now responsible for your own future. Look at the book of Numbers 14, 21. Read out loud. Come on, read it for yourself. Go. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the promised land. God is swearing I'm going to kill them. I told you all he said you kill them. You all think I was choking. Now, read why he said he's not going to take them in. Read why. He said they tested him and didn't obey him. Are we going to make it over? Not one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. I don't know about you, but I go on over. Now, you can talk for yourself, you know. Lord, I'm going over. I changed my mind. You, know, you ain't got to kill me in this desert. I'm willing to change my old thinking. 
crossing over. Look at the way it ends. Numbers 14, 2. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to. And his descendants will inherit the land. The only two people who survived the desert, only two, was Caleb and Joshua. Everybody else God killed. Now, I want to explain to you why God kept him for 40 years. God kept him for 40 years because it takes 40 years for a new generation to grow up. So when God bought him out, he took him in circles for 40 years. He was waiting for their children to drop out. He kept them 40 years because he wanted what was in their loins. So he kept them going in circles for 40 years until he got the next generation of people who never were in Egypt. And the Bible says when those children were born, then God killed all the parents. Okay, here we go. You all still don't believe me, eh? The Bible says... Look at this. Vote to the land when a slave becomes king. Let me read it again. Woe to the country when your leaders think like slaves. <laughs> Woe means damned. It's a horrible word. It means that you are damned. That means the country is damned if the leaders think still like slaves. There's this in the Bible. On whose princesses feast in the morning. In other words, all they want to do is sit up there, get fat, drink liquor, and eat big food early in the morning, wasting time, and ain't got no dream for the country. God says, Woe to that land. Look at some of you. That in the Bible? Yes, that in the Bible. See it there? 40 years, we still drinking and eating a lot of food in the morning. In the morning, he's supposed to be waking. We have him feast, he says. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of noble birth, whose princesses eat at a proper time. That means you work for us, then you eat. And you eat what you work for. Clap. I did my research on this state, first statement, eating in the morning. It actually is a Hebrew idiom. It actually means uh, you eat other people's food because you never work for that. See, you work all day, then you eat. But that statement means you eat first, which means that you didn't work for that. Import, 90%. What are we exporting? Do you know how you measure the wealth of a country? It's called GDP, Gross National Productivity. So a country is as wealthy as the productivity of the people. Yep. So if you ain't producing nothing, then you ain't rich. If you keep importing everything, you poor. Well. 40 years later, we still at 90%. I'm so glad we got young women in here who would be prime ministers. I can't hear the young women shout with me, come on. I'm so glad we see young men in here who will be prime ministers and they will change the entire country. If you believe that, go ahead and give God a hand for 40 years. Transformation. So Joshua was not born in Egypt. Joshua got his stories from Moses. Moses told Joshua about this slavery thing and how they were oppressed. And Joshua listened. And Joshua got to know the God of Moses. He's a young man. And then God told Moses, you're not going to go over. Why? Your mentality still ain't quite there. Because you're still cussing the rock. The very rock that fed and gave you water, you're now cursing at it. Your mentality ain't right. 
He said, so I can't take you over. He said, but lay your hands on Joshua. He would take the people over. The people who were not born in Egypt. 40 years. So Moses brought Joshua, put him before the people, laid his hands on him, and said, you shall take the people over. Joshua said, okay, got it. And the Bible says, then Moses died. God took him on the mountain, buried him. No one knows where his grave is today, thank God. The last chapter of Deuteronomy says, and Moses went up to the mountain and was no more. And the Lord said to Joshua, now take these people over. Read my lips. Moses is dead. Listen to me, please. Most important moment. Of, listen, listen, listen. He said, Joshua, Moses is dead. So take the people, the children over to the promised land. That's the way the book ends. When you turn the page, the first chapter is Joshua, chapter 1. It says, and the Lord said to Joshua, Moses is dead. Now, wait a minute. You told me that before. You're telling me again. Two different statements, though. The first one is referring to a person. Don't miss this. Joshua, Moses is dead. That's the person. Chapter 1 of Joshua. Joshua, Moses is dead. That's the error. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.